present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And verse 3 says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, 
but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. If, if we wanted to title this this morning, I thought about worship being restored. <coughs> worship being restored. I, I, I want my worship to be greater than it ever has been. I want my worship, uh, you know, and like we talked about last week, we talked about sometimes our, we look at praise, sometimes we call that worship. But worship is when we go deeper. Worship is when we get in the presence of God. And, and I think everybody knows that it's that, that it's such, but we sometimes we use the terms loosely, praise and praise and worship, and we put it together. And, and I, I want my, my praise to be higher, but I want my worship to be deeper. I want my praise to, to go and, and, and enter the throne room of God, but I want his presence to come down and put me in a place of worship that I've never been before. And I just thought through this scripture, that it was just like, I believe the Spirit just laid this on my heart. I never thought about this in this, this fashion or, 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 or way that, that it was coming out. But, but the Lord Jesus is the one who restored uh, worship. He restored worship. And we're going to look at that this morning. And I thought how convenient to look at this this morning and, and look at the fact that we're we're coming up on the Easter season and we celebrate the resurrection and and how wonderful it is that we celebrate this and what a and it's not a hope so maybe so religion that we have but it's a sure thing it's a it's a thing that 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 we can't even really describe we can't describe the love of God we can't describe what he's done for us in full but we know that it's real Amen. We know that we know that we've been born again. We know that we've been saved. We know that we've been changed by the power of God. It's not something that we just dreamed up one day. It's not something that we read out of a book uh, somewhere that, that has no uh, uh, basis. Or, but this is the word of God. It's the living word of God. And it has changed us and it continues to change me. And uh, this, this scripture this morning that we read in Romans chapter 12. David Jeremiah commentary tells us that the word beseech is the Greek verb of parakalite, parakaleo. It consists of para, which means beside, and kaleo, which means to call, and literally means to call, to exhort, or to urge. I beseech you. I call you, I, I urge you, I, 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 I call unto you to do this. I exhort you to, to, to it says, it says to, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. This parakaleo is, is used 54 times in Paul's epistles, demonstrating his heart as a counselor and an encourager to the infant church, rather than demanding authority over them, he was an encourager. He was a counselor. He urged them. He, he, as he says here, I beseech you, therefore, by the, to live for God, to make your bodies a living sacrifice for the Lord. Look at what he did. Look at the price that he paid. Look at the cost that he brought. It's, it's, not, it's reasonable for us to make ourselves a living sacrifice for the Lord. And then, if I may read this to you again, I want to read this again from the Amplified Version. I want you to see uh, maybe a little bit more in depth how this scripture pertains to us this morning. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves set apart as a living sacrifice. Holy, well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. It's our act of worship when we set our, ourselves aside for God. When we set ourselves aside to do God's work and God's ministry, and whether it be in prayer or whether it be in fasting or whether it be reading the Word of God. And, uh, you know, I was thinking what Brother Joe said just a little bit ago about reading the Word of God. And, and you know, you had to keep reading it. 
And, and I commend, I don't know if y'all knew, but Micah had read uh, the Bible in 30 days, cover to cover. It said it took him about, I think it was two, two and a half hours a day of reading to do that. So it can be done. You know, I was like, wow, I commend him for that. That's, that's awesome that he could do that. And, you know, maybe I'm, I probably would be, I'm a little bit slower reader, or maybe I'm a little denser up here than that. So it takes a while sometimes to get through. But uh, that's awesome. We need to read the Word of God. We need to, it can be done. It is something that we set apart. We set aside ourselves. And it says uh, here, and do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed, progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves, it says, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. For by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think of himself more, think more highly of himself and of his importance and ability than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. As God has apportioned to each a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service. Every one of us this morning have, have an appointed design that God has given us. Every one of us has an appointed faith that God has given us. Every one of us has an appointed talent that God has given us. And he's, he's given it to only you or to only me. But he's given something to all of us. And uh, I like what Tony Evans' uh, example of sacrifice and it may sound uh, somewhat comical, but, but uh, I like what he said about this concerning Romans 12 and 1. He said that that means complete and total surrender to Jesus. That part's not comical, but this part is. He says it's the difference between what the chicken and a pig bring to a bacon and egg breakfast. You think about that. What does a chicken and a pig bring to a bacon and egg breakfast. See, said the chicken makes a contribution. He said, but the pig gives everything. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. It says, what we often try to do with God is we try to give an egg here and we give an egg there, but God won't sacrifice the ham and the bacon only total surrender be, can be called true worship. Do we want to worship the Lord? It's going to cost us sacrifice. It's going to cost us some time. It's going to cost us some things. If we want to get closer to God, it's going to cost us an element in our life that we were taking up for ourselves or taking up for others or taking up for one thing or another. We have got to set aside time for God. We've got to set a sacrifice for God that we can grow in Him and grow in power and maturity. And that's what uh, Romans 12 here are saying that you live, be a living sacrifice unto the Lord, that we set aside ourselves. That You know, sometimes it's nothing wrong with some of the things maybe you watch on television or listen on the, the radio or, well, you know, now they got all kinds of apparatuses to listen to music. But it's not that those things are wrong. But does it take so much of our time away from the Lord? Does it take away time from, from God? And this is what Paul is exhorting. Oh, make your life a living sacrifice. Make some time for the Lord. Make some time for your life to grow spiritually, to grow mature in Christ, that you come into his presence, that you get to a place where it deepens your worship, to where you understand him more, that he is his he is, is, is depth of his love for you. You're going to understand a whole lot more when you make time for him. When you make time for worship. And then in verse 3, it goes on to say in the commentary, it says, Nobody should think more highly of himself than he should. 
The reason for this is everything we have is a gift. Do you realize everything that we possess is a gift? Our, our, our time, our talent, our resources, whatever we, whatever we have in us, whatever we have, whatever calling is upon our life, whatever uh, gifting we have in the spiritual realm, it is all a gift. Whether it is a gift of faith or a talent or a spiritual gift, we have not contributed one thing, have we? We haven't contributed anything. It's a gift. So we're not to think that we're all that plus a bag of chips, in other words. We're not to, uh, the other hand, Tony Evans reminds us that we can't go to the other extreme and disparage ourselves or yourself as if God has given you nothing. The Bible there says God has distributed a measure of faith to each one of us just because one own one own talents, they might not measure up to somebody else's greatness or maybe what, uh, the appearance of greatness. We're not to disparage what God has put in our life. It may seem small. It may seem insignificant. But you may do something greater in your life than, than the person that's on the stage that's known worldwide. You don't know. Don't disparage the gifts of God because God, it may look, not look like much. It might not look like you have all the, uh, the gifts and the talents that everybody else possesses, but God has given you a talent and God has given you a faith and we're to walk in it and not disparage what God has given us. If you think about it, it's really dangerous to say that God has given us less than when he's given us everything. Everything he's given us is a gift. He's given us his own son. What a gift we have. So as I go back to last week, and if you remember, if we believe that praise ushers in us ushers us into worship or being in the presence of the Lord. Then I ask us this morning, are we satisfied at just stopping at praise? Have we become satisfied just stopping at praise? Think about that for just a moment. With the sacrifice of what we give, I don't know about you. I don't have all the answers. Maybe I don't have all the knowledge, but in my mind, sometimes I believe that, that praise stops and worship sets in is when our voice gets quiet and God's presence settles in. I believe that when we get into worship, it's something that we cannot contain, we cannot do, we, can, we cannot pull down, we cannot manufacture, we cannot work it up. You can sing, I, I've been in churches, they can sing a fast song and they can tear it up. And, and they want to do that time after time after time like they want to pump up the spirit of the Lord. But you can't pump up, you can't manufacture the spirit of the Lord. But you can get in his presence. You can get in his presence, whether it's a, a fast, you know, the fast song may usher it in, a slow song may usher it in. No song may usher in the spirit of the Lord and the worship can take place. I'm talking about getting in the presence of God, feeling God touch, feeling God minister, feeling God meet needs and touch hearts and, and cause it. When the tears begin to flow, when God begins to touch, when God begins to minister, when the, the curses are broken, when the chains are broken, uh, when God begins to touch hearts and move in a special way that nobody can say it was this or that or the other, all they can do is say it was God. God that moved. It was God that touched. It was God that blessed. And that's what we should desire. That's what we should long for is the presence and the power of God and the, 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 just the touch of the presence of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah this morning. Are you with me this morning? Amen. Just longing for the presence of God to move in our midst. 
And the original worship is, I want to look at the original worship this morning. I want you to think about this. Genesis 3 and 8 says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Have you ever imagined this type of worship? Have you ever imagined this scenario prior to them falling to sin as worship? What am I talking about this morning, you may say? I'm talking about they were walking and talking in the presence of God. They were fellowshipping with God one-on-one. -on -one. They were able to walk with him, talk with him, just like I'm talking to you this morning. They were walking with God in the cool of the day. Could you imagine what, what, what they talked about? Could you imagine, you know, they might have told some funny, you know, sometimes we watch those videos of stuff of animals doing silly things. They might have told God, you know, we saw this critter over here doing some silly things, backflips or whatever. You don't know what they talked about. They might have talked about, oh, you know, when the sun come up this morning, it was so glorious. It was so magnificent. God, you did such a wonderful job. It was so beautiful. Oh, they might have talked about what they had to eat in the, the, the fruit that they were allowed to eat. Oh, man, it was the best thing I've ever. God, you just outdid yourself. They were having fellowship with God. God might have told them, you know how much I love you? You might know how much I care about you. Do you know all I want is for your comfort? All I want is to protect you. All I want is for you to enjoy this place. All I want is to just to talk with you and commune with you. Could you imagine what that was like? But here, worship was broken. It was broken. The original worship was in paradise. And it was paradise not because sin had not entered in and God walked with his creation. But fellowship was broken and communication was broken and worship was broken. Isn't that a sad thought to think about? Could you imagine, you know, when Adam and Eve left the garden that day, could you imagine what it felt like to know that they weren't going to be walking with God in the cool of the day anymore? They weren't going to enjoy, you know, out of all the things, out of all the paradise, out of all the fruit, out of all the things they saw, out of everything there, I believe in my heart that they miss God the most. I believe sincerely they miss the fellowship with God. Out of everything that was there, it was broken, it was gone. There was no more. And then as sin entered in the world, they were driven out of the garden. Worship became sporadic. Romans 5 and 12 tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Paradise was lost. Sin and its curse was, was gained. Fellowship with God was gone. It was lost Worship was lost. That's a sad thing to think about. Could you imagine if, if, if God had left us there? And, and we see throughout the scriptures, throughout the Bible, there was sporadic worship. We see in Genesis 4, 25, 
and 26, it said, Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth, for God, she said, had appointed me another seed instead of Abel, who came slew. And to Seth, to him, there was a born a son, and he called his name Enos. And then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. He began to call upon the Lord. We need God. We need God. I, I think that's the, that's the greatest deception that the devil can ever put on any human being is to say that they don't need God. I need him. I need, I need God more than the breath that's in my lungs. I need God more than the blood that flows through my veins. I need God more than, than the water that we drink or the food that we eat. I need him more than anything that's in this world. I need God more. And, and that's when we begin to call upon God. And there was times and instances where, where humans began to call upon the name of the Lord and cry out to God. Even though the humans had fallen to sin, do we not see throughout the scriptures that God was merciful time and time again despite the divide from a holy God to a sin-cursed man? God reached out over and over and over again. His mercies, his love, his grace poured out to man until the day that Jesus could come on the scene. Genesis 5, 23 says... In all the days of Enoch, there were 360 and five years, and, and Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. Do we see a, a, a parallel here? Do we see a pattern here that Enoch walked with God? Enoch walked with God just like uh, Adam and Eve did in the garden. And I, I look at this this morning, I see, we see Enoch echoes of Eden where Adam and Eve used to walk with God. One reason I believe God took Enoch was that he was showing the devil that, uh, that true worship and walking with God uh, in his creation was going to be possible again. You might say, well, you crazy. I, I do. I believe that, that, that the devil thought, oh, I got Adam and Eve. I caused them to sin. I caused them to fail. And, and look at the mess the world is in. And, and here God planted Enoch. And, and Enoch walked with God. And God said, watch this devil. He's going to come up where I'm at. Because he walks with me. He loves me. He serves me. He's before me and doing what I've asked him to do. What might have been broken was now sporadic. We find that in Genesis, there's somebody else that was walking with God. So the generations in chapter 6 of Noah, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. God. He was walking with God. He was pleasing God. He was worshiping God. He was fellowshipping with God. In the Bible, we know that, that Noah found that grace that God put him in that ark and took care of him. Took care of him and his family and the whole world was destroyed by water. But we see these words again. He walked with God. Walking is a lifestyle, pleasing the Lord. But I also believe that there is fellowship in walking. I believe there is a being in the presence of God, I believe is walking with the Lord. I believe it encompasses all those things. All, all the, although the world was totally corrupt, God still had someone who had fellowship with him. And right now, you know, we look and we hear and we talk about it with other pastors. And, you know, it seems like our, our churches and our numbers is all falling off. But God has a people. We might not see it. We might not recognize it. But God has a people. It might not be here like we expected. It might not be at other churches like they expected. But around the world, God has a people that are fellowshipping with him and walking with him. And then we find something a little bit different here. In Exodus 33, it says, Moses entered the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. 
And the Lord talked with Moses. My goodness. Think about what Moses saw. You know, we didn't, he didn't see him face to face. The Bible bears that out. But think about being in the presence of God. He was probably in a cloud, but he knew that God was there. In that sense, sometimes you know, we don't visibly see anything. There's been times when I, I've been in churches where you see the Shekinah glory of God. You see the presence of God almost come down. But you don't see God, per se. You don't see him face to face. But Moses was like the, uh, no, he was like this in the fact that he didn't see him, but he felt the presence of God. He knew that it was the Lord. So then the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp and, and his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man departed not out of the tabernacle. There was a time where Moses was up on the mountain, as you recall, and he came back down and his face was glowing from the presence of God. Being in his presence. What was that glowing? That was God on the inside of him coming out. That's what we should be to the world. We should be. We should have a light about our face. I mean, it might not be, be glowing like Moses' was to where he had to put a veil over his face because people <laughs> were afraid of him. But it, we've got to have the, the Holy Ghost inside of us pouring out of us to where people see Jesus. They need to know there is a, a presence of God that is real, that is true, that is, is moving in our day. There was a place where Moses, God allowed Moses to see the back of God as he walked by. He wasn't permitted to see his face. He says, no man had seen his face and lived. But he was permitted to see the back part of God. And then God himself buried Moses to which no one knows where he's at but God. Again, I believe that there he shows the devil that he's got all power and authority. God has all authority. God has all power. God, I believe, has a work for Moses to do in the future. And the devil would love to disrupt that, but he's not going to because he don't know where he's at. 1 Samuel 13 says, But now thy kingdom shall not continue. It's talking about Saul. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. The Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. We're talking about King David. David worshipped the Lord. How did David worship the Lord? We could look at it many different ways, but all through his life, even when he was a young lad, he recognized God's presence in his life. He recognized, as I mentioned, I think just the other week, the, the bear and the lion that came in and, to, and after the sheep, he realized he had the power that, that he could do and take care of that because God gave it to him. He realized that that giant Goliath was there and he realized it wasn't in his might or his power that he was going to prevail, but he realized that through the presence of God, that God would give him the victory over it. David worshipped the Lord. He, he exercised in all that he did. He had a heart after God's own heart. What the scripture we just read. He had a heart that longed for God. He had a, a heart that longed for God's presence. And he had a heart that, that one place he says, don't take thy Holy Spirit from me. He desired the presence of God. Do we desire the presence of God as David did? Do we want to see God move in our midst and in our circumstances? Uh, even when it gets too hard to carry, even when we feel like giving up or giving in or giving out, whatever it may be, whatever we're facing, God can bring us through 
through, but it's going to take us getting into the place of worship to where God is able to move and break the things that are binding the house of God. God is able to break it if we'll get into the place of worship and exalt his name. There's a place where David danced before the Lord with all his might. His wife, Michael, as you know, she disdained him. She, she, she thought he just made a, a fool of himself. But David said, you call me king, but God has placed me here. The God that I serve is greater than my authority. The God that I serve is greater than my power is king. So yes, I will dance before the Lord. I will praise him. I will exalt him. I will worship him. That's what he was saying when Michael spewed her words to him that day. David was mentioned over and over again throughout the kings. Think about it. If you go through the scripture, I've been reading here there a lot here lately. Going back through, I've been going through Samuel and 1 Kings, 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles and all the things of the kings and how they, you know, after Solomon, you know, it just all went downhill, you know. The kingdom was split in two. And this one did evil, and this one did good a little bit, and this one did bad. You know, it's just over and over again. And But they compare this. He either walked not as his father David did, or he walked according to David did. But sadly, most of them walked not as their father David did. Are we walking where God wants us to walk? Are we walking in his presence? Are we walking where God can move? Are we walking where God can touch? Not just our lives, but others. Others that are around us. Are we walking to where we're pleasing to God? If we look like if we look like a bunch of crazy people worshiping God like David was that day, are we going to worship God anyhow and not worry about what people think or say or do? Because we know whom we have believed in. We know in who has delivered us. We know in who's changed us. His power is real. Whether it be prophet or king, there were hundreds more like them who worshiped God. But one day, worship was restored. And I want you to think about this as we approach this Easter season. And this, I believe that's why the Lord led us into this, this scripture this morning. In Mark 15, 37 and 38 says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and he gave up the ghost on the cross. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And many commentaries talk about this, and I've, I've read this and probably preached it before as well, but for that veil that was thick and heavy, for it to be ripped from the top, they said it was as if God ripped it open apart himself. When Jesus died on the cross, you can go back and you could study the tabernacle. There was the holy and then the holy place, and then there, there was the most holy place. The, they call it the holy of holies. And the only person that could go in there was one time a year was the high priest who could enter there one time a year and make sacrifice there that he would present to the Lord the sins of the people. And if his life wasn't right with God, they had bales on his skirts. They had a rope tied around his ankle. If he died in the presence of the Holy of Holies and in the presence of God, they could pull him out with the rope because they couldn't go in there. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was. It's where God met with them between the cherubims, it says. It talks about in the scriptures. The presence of God was manifested there in the holiest of holy. Again, in the temple, the same thing, even though the structure had changed, it was still a 
place where God met with his people. And now, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil that covered the temple, the Holy of Holies, was rent in two. And God, through Jesus this morning, has given us access to come into the very presence of God. We can come boldly, the Bible says, before the throne of grace. We can get into his presence. We can walk in his presence. We can enjoy his presence. We can enjoy his fellowship. We can enjoy his walk. We can come in a place of union and worship that we never were afforded before. We could never do it again. Uh, all the way back, it goes back to Adam and Eve. Is the only one that's ever experienced that walking with the Lord, that closeness But here, we talked about it being sporadic, but worship is now restored for all who will come to the name of Jesus. All who will believe on the name of Jesus. All who will come unto him is able to be in the presence of the Lord. So when we come into the house of the Lord, do we rush what we do? Do we rush what we say? Do we rush what we do we get in a hurry? Do we go through the motions? Are we here just to, out, out of formality? Or do we come expecting to meet in the presence of God? We need God to move and minister to our needs. We don't need to keep coming in and going out the same way. We need a God that can touch us and move and minister. And not just that. We don't have to wait till we get in the house of God for God to move. We can be in our homes. We can be going down the road, wherever it may be, we can wait and get in the presence of God. You may be out on the side of a mountain. You may be down by the river bank. But God's presence, you can get into God's presence if you will tarry and pray and seek his face. That is what we need more than anything else. Worship was restored at Calvary. Worship was restored because of the cross. We have access unto God. And now when we come, do we just, like I said earlier, do are we just excited that we get to praise the Lord? Or do are we excited when worship? comes. Worship is a little different. I believe worship is a little deeper. I believe worship is when God changes us. I need to be changed. How about you? I need to be changed. As long as I live in this old earthly body, I need to be changed. One of these days I'm longing for a change that's going to change me forever. And that's the day that Jesus comes back and takes us out of here in the rapture. I'm going to be changed. I, you know, I never thought about it before. Uh, uh, what Brother Joe said this morning was so, uh, something just struck me. I, I meant to say something earlier and it just slipped my mind. But, you know, I never really thought about it before. But you know, we won't need sleep. I don't know about you, but, you know, I get tired in these old bodies. I need my sleep, you know. But could you imagine in our heavenly body, we won't need no sleep. We won't get fatigued. We won't get tired. Our eyes won't get droopy. Have you ever thought? I never really, really thought about that. I never thought of, you know, our bodies won't feel like, uh, like you might feel later today because you lost an hour of sleep. It won't take you a week to recover from daylight savings time. I don't think we'll have to worry about it because Jesus is the light of the city. We won't have to worry about that, but you won't feel that drag, you know. I usually notice that two or three days after the change. I don't know about you, but I feel like, you know, sometimes I'm, it's around lunchtime. I start getting hungry about 11 o'clock. I say, man, I'm hungry. This ain't right. I'm going to wait another hour because the time changes. Yeah. But your body adjusts, but without sleep, your mind's in a fog for a day or two sometimes. Mine's that way anyhow, but, you know, sometimes that's the way we are. We don't have to worry about that then. 
worship will be restored. I was thinking, what was in the beginning was fellowship with God, worship of God. It went through separation. It went through sporadic times. Jesus has made it possible that to all who believe that we could walk with God again. The place where only the high priest could enter into the most holy place once a year could be accessed by all. One of, the, one of my favorite stories, I, I know I've probably used it a lot, and uh, y'all hear it a lot, probably hear a lot more, but think about those disciples on the road to Emmaus. And I think about how they were telling Jesus all about it, you know. And we thought that this was the Christ. We thought he was the one that was going to deliver Israel. Have you not heard these things? And, and besides all this, this is, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the third day and now they've taken his body. We don't know what's become of him. We don't know what's going on. And I'm paraphrasing some of that, but you know the story. And, that, and they were so broken that they couldn't see Jesus. They were so out of step with the Lord that they couldn't see God moving. And sometimes I think we get that way in the church world. We get doing our thing and we forget we're in the presence of God. We forget that God's moving. And it wasn't until he got with them that night and he broke bread and gave thanks that they realized they were in the presence of God. And he vanished out of their sight. May we not miss the moving of God. May we not miss the presence of God. 